thank you so much, and good morning, everyone. It's so wonderful to be here with you all. Uh, and thank you for that very kind introduction, Anka. I really appreciate that. So I'm looking forward to our time together this morning uh, as we uh, delve further into intercultural competence. Although, Anka, I feel like you more or less summarized what I was going to say anyway. So maybe we can just go to coffee break. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you so much. Um, before I begin, I want to start with some acknowledgments. This is becoming more um, common in the United States, as we have learned from our Canadian um, colleagues who have been doing this for a long time. But I wanted to acknowledge um, that I live and work on the ancestral lands of the Shikori, Okanichi, and Catawba peoples in what is now the state of North Carolina. Um, and I want to give gratitude to the, to, the, to the land itself and to the stewards of the land, past, present, and future. Also, in addition to that, I want to um, acknowledge the overlapping histories of the land in which I uh, live and work, including the past violence and ongoing harm produced by the legacy of racialized slavery and oppression. And so I want to kind of start with that. I also want to acknowledge that I am not a cross-cultural psychologist, and psychology is not my field. Um, but as you've heard, my field has primarily and predominantly been in education, and in particular, international education. So I will be speaking to you today from that perspective. And I find that there's a lot that we can learn from each other from those different disciplinary perspectives. And so I'm really impressed that you actually, you've invited others beyond psychology to come and be here with you. And I am thoroughly enjoying this conference and learning a lot in the sessions and, and from all of you. So thank you again so much for that invitation. Speaking of invitations, I want to start also with some invitations for you. As you heard Anka mention, there is an, a, a global nonprofit called the World Council on Intercultural and Global Competence. Um, and you are welcome to join. It's free to join. And we will be having a session later this afternoon so you can learn more. There are over 20 different working groups uh, touching on a lot of the topics that we've been talking about here at this conference. Um, and there's actually going to be a virtual networking uh, event happening next Wednesday. Uh, to which you're all invited as well, and we can talk some more about that this afternoon. And then also there is um, a peer-reviewed Intercultural Connector publication, uh, and you'll see the deadline there. So we'd love to have, particularly students in our midst, we would love to have you submit also to this uh, publication. So I'm um, happy to talk with you all more about that this afternoon. So for this morning, here's a little bit of kind of where we're going to go beginning to unpack more about intercultural competence, I want to share with you um, one uh, methodology that I've been working on with the United Nations for developing intercultural competence uh, in, in persons around the world, uh, and inviting you to join in that effort as well, and, and then end with kind of looking to the future. So that's where we're headed. I wanted to kind of take some time now to kind of think about where we've been over the past three years in particular. And I think it's important that we remember um, all that we've been through together and how amazing it is that we are now gathered here in person. I know it kind of feels like life is getting back to normal. We can kind of breathe again. Um, we're enjoying each other's company and learning from each other. But I think we, it's important that um, through these three years, we've been reminded of the power of human connection as we have all experienced isolation, confinement, social distancing, and even fear. Remember those early days? A lot of fear. We uh, witnessed powerful images of frontline workers giving their all, and neighbors in cities and towns across the world connecting from balconies, through window panes. Remember those images? These images remind us of how much our lives depend on those around us and how important it is that we renew our efforts in learning how to live together. I think the pandemic years were an opportunity for us to reflect upon what matters most, what binds us all together, and what it means to be good neighbors to each other. So through all of this, I think we've learned a lot 
And I hope we will take those lessons forward as we continue to move into this quote, post-pandemic era. The literature and research to date on intercultural and global competence looks at definitions mostly focused on knowledge and skills and attitudes and focused on the individual. But I'm wondering, in the time that we've had in these last three years, if perhaps we can begin to shift our thinking a bit um, and bring into for the, some new research questions. For example, what if we viewed ourselves more through the lens of we instead of me? What if we viewed ourselves through the lens of neighbors, both local and global neighbors? And what does it look like to get along together as neighbors to each other? And that's where intercultural competence comes in. See, what is it about us as humans? What is it about living together on this planet? And what does it take for us to get along together? That question is what has driven me to do the research I've done on intercultural competence for over the last decade. What is necessary for us to get along together as humans? And so today I'm Excited to share with you some big picture of what's happening at the global level, delve a bit more into some of the research around intercultural competence, and look at what does this mean concretely for us. And I'm eager to hear your ideas and, and thoughts as well. So I've had the opportunity to work um, at the global level with the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD. Some of you may know that OECD does the PISA, test, the program on international student assessment. How many of you are familiar with PISA? Yeah? So in 2018, PISA actually tested global competence in 15-year-olds around the world. So I had a chance to be one of the four experts working with the OECD on that piece of it. So you can find the 400 pages of analysis and results online from OECD. Won't go into that too much today. Um, I've also, in particular, been working with United Nations and UNESCO in a number of different projects related to global citizenship education, related to intercultural competence specifically, and I'll say more about that in a moment, and then also on intercultural dialogue. And UNESCO has a new framework out around intercultural dialogue that you may be interested in having a look at. Um, and it's in a publication called We Need to Talk. And so I encourage you to have a look at that. And then Council of Europe has been doing quite a bit of work around this as well, in particular around the competencies for democratic culture. So kind of looking big picture, what's happening globally, that's some of it, and kind of coming back to this question. This is the burning question for me. And, and I kind of want you to think, what would you answer to this? What would be your response to what is necessary for us to get along together? And to that end, I invite you to think about someone you know. This could be someone you know personally, uh, a peer, a colleague, family member, neighbor, or someone known to you, such as a famous person, that you feel does a really good job of connecting with lots of diverse others. So fix in your mind, who is that person? Who is someone you could say, aha, they do a really good job of connecting with Lots of diverse others, different ages, religions, socioeconomic backgrounds, whatever those differences might be. And think about how you would describe that person. What is it about them that allows them to connect so well with others? And what descriptions would you use for that person? I've done this activity with many different groups around the world as part of the work with, with UNESCO. And it's so interesting to see that some of the same words emerge, no matter the group of people, no matter who they're thinking of. And often what emerges are words that describe the research on intercultural competence. And so I wanted to kind of share with you some of that. These are some of the more recent um, 
frameworks. I know you're not going to be able to see those, but just wanted to bring those to your attention. And we're going to delve more into the, the one that I'm most familiar with, which is, which is the, the intercultural competence model from my research. But you'll see the framework from um, the Council of Europe that they've used for democratic culture, the OECD framework that was used in the PISA global competence. And of course, Byram, many of you are familiar with Byram's work, has just recently published a kind of update uh, from his 1997 work. So these are just a few, but the reality is there's been over 60 years worth of scholarly work on intercultural competence. And I notice oftentimes at conferences, maybe here and then also even in international education, these words are thrown around and they're often not defined. Just talk about intercultural competence as if everybody knows what we mean when actually there's over 60 years worth of scholarly work done on this construct. And it comes by many different names, depending on the discipline, right? So, yes, there's intercultural competence. There's also global competence. There's cultural intelligence, global citizenship, intercultural sensitivity. The list can go on. There are actually over 30 different terms used to describe this construct. And so much of it depends on the discipline. And I was working with a group of engineers, and even then they said, yeah, we mostly use global competence, but we can also use other terms too. So, so much of it depends on, on the group that's working with the, with the definition. What you see here is the first research-based definition and framework of intercultural competence. So even though there's been 60 years worth of work, very little that has been research-based in terms of a framework. And so I was keen to see, could there be consensus from all these different scholars on what exactly is intercultural competence? And so that resulted in this framework that you'll see. It's the same framework, two different variations of looking at it because it's difficult for any model or framework to capture the whole of reality, right? So I want to unpack this a little bit for you. Competence typically is defined as knowledge, skills, and attitudes. That's the basic definition of competence. So I wanted to know well, what attitudes. Three key attitudes emerged from this research with these intercultural experts. And you see those here, respect of truly valuing each other as fellow humans, recognizing that 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 can take many different forms of behavior. And it's important that we respect each other, especially with those who don't think like us or agree with us, which is sadly often missing in today's world. The openness, the open-mindedness, very important, and then curiosity of wanting to learn more about each other and not being satisfied with, yeah, I, it's okay, I know enough, <laughs> I don't need to learn anymore. We need to keep learning every day. And then together, it starts with those attitudes, then we come to the knowledge piece. The knowledge, particularly around the cultural self-awareness, uh, and then we get to the culture-specific information, um, and I think that's where the beauty of cross-cultural psychology comes in, is understanding what this is like in context, right? Uh, the sociolinguistic awareness, and this deeper understanding around the con all that comes into understanding the context, particularly worldviews, combined with skills. And I was a little surprised, because I was expecting more specific skills for intercultural competence. But what emerged, as you see here, not that specific. Listening, listening to each other, and, and continued research shows that that is really fundamental as a starting point, listening. And I'll say more about that in a moment. Observing, interpreting, knowing where to get the information, what to do with it, right? And so together, knowledge, skills, and attitudes, what do we want to see from this? Kind of like, so what? Well, so what is that we hope inside ourselves that we hopefully develop more adaptability, more flexibility. In the end, perhaps even empathy. <laughs> and some of you may have done a lot of research on the empathy part. And then in the end, what we see and experience as we interact 
with each other is behavior and communication that is both effective and appropriate. And I want to just mention a little bit about those words. A lot of intercultural literature talks about effectiveness, particularly in the business world. A lot of the business literature talks about effectiveness. That is only half of the picture for intercultural competence. The other half is in appropriateness. And um, this is where it becomes quite complex and tricky even. Because if you ask me if I have been effective and appropriate, I might say, yeah, 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 sure. I've met my goals. Um, yeah, I think that was effective and appropriate. I can answer the effectiveness part, but what about the appropriateness part? Only you will know whether I've been appropriate or not. And you might say, Darla violated every cultural norm we know. <laughs> and so that's where even the assessment of intercultural competence becomes very complex. And that can be a talk for a different day because some of you know I've done a lot of research and work around assessing intercultural competence, which needs to be from a multi-measure, multi-perspective approach. And so many of the instruments out there are self-report. And again, that's only half the picture. So we can talk more about the assessment piece later, maybe this afternoon. But you can see as we begin to unpack what intercultural competence is, it's so much more than what might meet the eye. And so, those elements that I just talked about were first put into what you see as the pyramid model. But there was a problem, I thought, with that model and not matching the research because it implies, at least when I was looking at it, a point at which we become interculturally competent. And that wasn't fitting the research because this is a lifelong process. This is a lifelong journey that each of us is on. And so that's where the process model came in to say, this is a journey for our students, for ourselves. And every day we can go towards something we don't know. We can continue to learn how to live together with each other every day. So a lot of that information you can find online and in different publications. With any research, there are always limitations. So with this, obviously, are limitations to the framework I just showed you. One of those being that the experts involved in this study, which by the way used a Delphi methodology, which is a quasi-quantitative qualitative methodology. Happy to talk with you this afternoon more about that if you'd like to learn more. The experts involved in this study were all from the global north. So you already see one of the limitations of this model, that this is coming out of the global north. Most of the experts resided um, in the U.S. There were a couple outside the U.S. Yet again, another limitation. Um, that being said, it is interesting how this has resonated with colleagues in different parts of the world. Um, there was only one element that experts agreed on 100% as being absolutely essential to intercultural competence. And that was kind of buried in the knowledge part where it talked about other worldviews, being able to see the world from others' perspectives. That was the only element they all agreed on, 100% as being absolutely essential. But that's really hard to do, right? Because no matter how much I want to see the world through your lens, I will never be able to do that because I'm always seeing it through my lens. A little bit like the sunglass analogy you've perhaps heard of. People born with blue sunglasses, yellow sunglasses, they put on each other's sunglasses, and what color do they see? They see green, right? Because always seeing the world through our own lens, our own culturally conditioned lens. But that has raised a burning question for me. What are others' perspectives on intercultural competence um, beyond what I've just shared with you? So I had the opportunity to uh, have a Fulbright experience in South Africa several years ago, and I'm excited to be, be going back now as the UNESCO Chair of Intercultural Competence at Stellenbosch. And through some of that research, one of the pieces that emerged was around this concept of Ubuntu. I am because we are. We are because I am. You cannot separate the individual <laughs> as we so often do. Right? So that's a different way of looking at the world. 
In the Andean cultures, there are several concepts. One of them, called Buen Viver, that's talking about how we are all connected to all living things. And I was thrilled to hear some of the presentations here and the, the visuals around the human not on top, but as part of the, the living world. So those are some different ways of looking at intercultural competence. Other cultures also focus much more on relationship. And what would change if our research focused more on relationship intercultural competence than individual intercultural competence, right? So these are all questions that we can unpack and look at further. So the UN was also interested in looking at this. And so I, along with several others, worked with them on a project several years ago on trying to understand what are some emerging themes in the different regions around the world related to intercultural competence. And you can find that in this publication. But here were some of the themes that emerged, particularly around the respect, the listening, relationship building, cultural humility, that in the end, maybe it's not so much about the competence, but it's about in how we approach others and recognizing that we don't know as much about the world as we think we do. And we still have a lot to learn. So that led to a more recent project that I've been working with UNESCO on. Following this publication I just shared with you, different member states came to UNESCO and said, you know, thanks for this. Still feels pretty abstract. Uh, can, you, can you make this more concrete? How do you develop intercultural competence in individuals? So UNESCO came to me and said, OK, Darla, um, let's work together and see if we can find a tool or methodology that can be used with any group of people anywhere in the world using little to no resources. Yeah, that was the good one. <laughs> and that could be facilitated by really anyone. Doesn't need to be someone who has any special training in intercultural communication. <laughs> that was my reaction too. <laughs> so if you were given this conundrum, what would you come up with? What would you say? Like, huh. Uh, a colleague and I had just put together a book of over 50 activities on building cultural competence, and none of those worked. We could just throw that out the window because there was something in there that didn't meet, meet the criteria that they were looking for. So we started a group uh, looking at kind of doing some focus groups and interviews with, with persons around the world. See, my goodness, what could even possibly work given what the criteria were? But guess what? It was so interesting to see what emerged. Two things. One, the sharing of personal stories and sharing those through circles. Hence, UNESCO story circles. Now, circles have existed in indigenous cultures for centuries. And they've come into mainstream society and are being used in many different ways for many different purposes. How many of you have participated in a circle, any kind of circle? Yeah, so they're reading circles, talking circles, <laughs> even little children use those at maybe the beginning of every day in their classroom. Um, there are restorative justice circles, peace building circles, many different kinds of circles. This is the first time that circles are being used for the purpose of developing and practicing key intercultural competencies. And so, to share with you a bit more, um, this is available through an open access manual in six different languages, soon to be seven. Um, so you can, you can download this from the UNESCO site. And we piloted this in all five UNESCO regions around the world, because UNESCO wanted to see, does this really work with any group of people anywhere? So we started off pre-pandemic. We got these in just before the pandemic. We piloted these in Bangkok, Thailand, in Harare, Zimbabwe, San Jose, Costa Rica, Tunis, Tunisia, and in Vienna, Austria. Only one of those was in a formal learning setting. 
two of those five pilots were literally outside under trees. And these were done with different groups of people. In San Jose, this was with indigenous leaders. In uh, Tunis, this was with youth activists. It was so inspirational to work with these young people. So different groups of people were involved um, with these pilots. And since then, we've been using the UNESCO Story Circles all over the world, both in person and during the pandemic, virtually. They've been used to train UN staff, UN peacekeepers in Mali, health workers, and of course, in universities in many different ways. I use these usually the first day of my class when I teach. Um, and students refer to the story circle experience the whole rest of the semester. So this afternoon we can talk more about the details of all of this around UNESCO story circles. But what we found works best is that we do these in groups of four to six. There is no facilitator in the group, unlike quite a few more traditional circles. Therefore, it's very scalable. So I have actually done this in Beijing, China with several hundred teachers. I've done this online with several hundred. So it can be very scalable, um, and it's quite adaptable to the context. It's very adaptable to the context. But it follows a rather structured protocol. And this is an example of those protocols. This is, there are three rounds. They are timed. Um, there's an icebreaker round, and you'll see an example of the icebreaker round. The one that we've used most often is to say your name, and three words or phrases that describe your identity and background, and why those words are important to you. The second round is the heart of this story circle. That's the personal story you share from your own life experience. Uh, the one that we've used most often is to tell a specific memorable experience you've had with someone different from you and what you learned about yourself and or the other person. And then the last round is something we call the flashback round. It goes very quickly. And you basically just complete this sentence about the stories that you've heard. You just say the most memorable part of your story for me was this. And so it's amazing what happens in about the 90 minutes it takes to go through the UNESCO Story Circle experience. And the outcomes that we've seen from these 90 minutes far exceed what I've seen in half to full day intercultural trainings. So it's very powerful um, what happens during this, this time of sharing and connecting more deeply with each other. And as I started this morning, those deeper connections is what is so needed in today's world that becomes increasingly uh, divided by political tensions. So again, this is the uh, website where you can download the manual. You'll find lots of resources there uh, in the manual. And here are some photos from those uh, pilots that were done. Uh, in the, and you'll see the folks sitting outside <laughs> as we were doing the story circles. Um, but really, really amazing experiences um, using UNESCO story circles. Here are some other places where we've used story circles, you'll see there. Um, and they've been used by UNHCR with refugees um, and in preparing those who work with refugees. So I, I did want to highlight that piece as well. Those who participate in story circles come out of it, um, saying that they now feel like they have some new best friends oftentimes. And these are some of the lessons learned from those who go through story circles, the importance of seeking first to understand, um, the ability to connect more deeply with each other through each other's stories, particularly the importance of listening for understanding. And I can't emphasize that enough. Um, if you recall the, the model I shared with you, listening was one of the key skills that came out of that research. And it's not just any kind of listening. As humans, we typically listen for response or for judgment, right? And when I'm listening in that way, I'm thinking, how will I respond to you? What is my opinion of what you're saying? Who am I focused on? On me, right? <laughs> I'm still thinking about me. Listening for understanding means we focus 100% on the person speaking, on the words they are saying, on how they are saying it, on the nonverbals. 
We give our full attention to the person speaking, trying to get rid of any distracting thoughts in our heads or on our phones, <laughs> right? We don't do that enough today, of that listening for understanding. And, and one thing I invite all of you to do as, as, as you go forth into the rest of the sessions today is to practice that listening for understanding, to give ourselves fully to listening to each other. So um, you'll see here some of the other uh, lessons learned. Um, and it's been incredible to see uh, what comes from this. Now, all this to say is that this is just a start for developing intercultural competence. As I mentioned earlier, intercultural competence is a lifelong journey for all of us. So this is just one step in that journey. And there's so much more that can be done beyond a story circle experience. In the manual, there are action plan sheets where the person that you can work with people to develop action plans, have them revisit, talk about what they're going to do next, etc. There are a lot of other materials there. But this is just one step in that development process. Here's another resource for you. Um, International Association of Universities does a survey of universities every, about every five years. And they look at internationalization efforts at universities around the world. And I was particularly keen on looking at what are the two top intercultural competence methods that are used in universities for developing intercultural competence. One is to focus on developing students' perspectives. Remember, that was the one item that all the experts agreed on as being really essential. And the other is to focus on the professors. Huh. That's really interesting, yeah? Because what we're finding is that students are often further along in their intercultural journey than the professors. That has some real implications, doesn't it? <laughs> so what does it look like to focus on the professors, provide the necessary professional development, looking at how to integrate this truly uh, into all courses when possible? And there are some universities that are they're looking to do that not just the usual suspects of language courses, for example. Um, interestingly, according to the survey, Asia, Pacific, and the Middle East have the highest percentage of institutional-wide learning outcomes related to intercultural competence development, not Europe. Um, and some of the more common extracurricular activities used at universities include what we might you know, consider as uh, many universities having, such as buddy or mentor programs, uh, intercultural skill building workshops for staff and students, among other activities. So in higher education, what we're seeing is that for intercultural competence development to occur, we need to make sure we go beyond mobility. I can't tell you how, ma how many times I've heard university administrators say, oh, let's just send students abroad, they'll come back interculturally competent. If only it were that easy, and it's not, as we all know, um, that having an experience in another country is not sufficient. And in fact, particularly in my country, in the US, when a group of US students travel together with a US professor and they go to Ireland or wherever, and then come back, and they never really have any meaningful interactions, oftentimes that can create more harm than good. Uh, so there's a lot of research that's been done around how to develop meaningful intercultural experiences in study abroad. It's important as educators that we go beyond knowledge and recognizing that intercultural competence is much more than just knowledge about a context, but it's also the skills and attitudes. Increasingly, we need to look beyond humans to looking at the interconnectedness of all living beings and with the natural, natural world, and thrilled about the theme of this conference in that regard, too. Um, we need to go beyond one course or module. Oftentimes, you've probably seen colleagues who might just stick in one reading or talk about intercultural competence for one day and say, okay, we're good, let's move on. It needs to be embedded and integrated throughout all of what we do. Um, oftentimes, we, need to, we have administrators focusing on results. This is a lifelong journey. It's not a point about trying to have a higher score on an intercultural competence survey. In fact, oftentimes what we might want to see are lower scores because, at the end, because students realize, ah, there's still a lot more I need to learn about the world. 
Um, and recognizing that pre and post is not sufficient, there's much more focus on the uh, formative assessments now, and we have to go beyond a one-size-fits-all, again, because our students and ourselves are at different places in that journey. In the end, it's also about this broader context, not just what we ourselves are doing, but looking more at a, what's called a whole school approach, looking at the entire environment, the learning environment, the policies, the practices, and this is where what increasingly is coming out is EDI, DEI, or what we're talking about is JEDI, Justice, Equity, Diversity, Inclusion, come in with the policies and practices as well. We're seeing a lot of overlap between the two because the definition of intercultural competence now has expanded to say it's interactions across difference, whatever those differences might be. And we're not talking just about, quote, cultural or ethnic differences anymore. Here are some questions that we need to ask ourselves and to think further about in terms of whose perspectives are uh, represented, whose voices are missing, uh, who are we privileging through what we're doing, Lots of these key questions we need to be asking ourselves in our work. Here are some emerging themes that we're seeing. Um, Anka already mentioned the importance of intentionality. You all talk a lot about the, the context, the relevance of context, but also looking at the, the role of active engagement in developing intercultural competence, focusing much more on the process, uh, and then, of course, continuing to look at those different perspectives. Here are some trends that we're seeing. Again, I mentioned the intersections with JEDI, Justice, Equity, Diversity, Inclusion. Importance of peer assessment and viewing students as our partners. This is not something we're doing to them, but with them, especially since they're further along in the journey oftentimes. It's about a long-term commitment and about looking at how do we connect all of this in real-world contexts outside of our classroom. And that's where high-impact practices such as service learning and working with refugees in the community, bringing that learning back into the classroom can be very helpful. And then here are some strategies for kind of thinking further about intercultural competence. Um, a lot of these we have been talking about here at this conference, we'll continue to talk about. Um, but again, focusing on that lifelong learning commitment uh, in the end is, is what's very important, and prioritizing that listening for understanding. That's where it all starts. As we look more broadly to the future, we can see quite a few of these um, trends, I don't know what you call them, emerging from the, the, some key reports. So I was involved a bit with the UNESCO, um, had a Futures of Learning report that came out recently looking at Education to 2050, OECD, I've been working with some also on looking at Education 2030. I was trying to summarize some of the key themes that were emerging from these reports that have been published. And these are some of the themes that, that seem to be coming out, including the well-being part. Uh, in fact, well-being is at the center of the OECD report. Um, but then also looking at some of these other pieces, uh, particularly the importance of building community uh, with our learners and, and looking at how we can continue this learning beyond traditional spaces and places. So to conclude and kind of summarize, um, this is a, a, a one way to think about it. Uh, so a colleague of mine, Lily Aris Ratton smith she's based in Australia, she and I have been doing quite a bit of work around intercultural competence and have published a few books together. And this is in, in our more recent book that, that came out based on um, collecting stories from students uh, based on the UNESCO story circles. And so as we look to develop intercultural competence, it's important, again, the intentionality piece, to be more aware of our own intercultural competence development um, and how we are progressing in our own journeys, um, seeking first to understand, uh, making sure we're, we're intentionally addressing these through stated outcomes if we're teaching, empowering our students as partners, and in the end, reflecting on this holistic intercultural competence experience. That it's not enough to just t take it out and talk about it a little bit and put it back, but it's about this holistic experience uh, for ourselves and for our students. So, your turn again, just reflect briefly. That's a lot of information I've shared with you. 
what is one takeaway for you from our time together? What's one thing you're going to remember? And more importantly, what is one action step that you will take, that you will commit to taking uh, in advancing intercultural competence in your context? So I invite you to think for a moment. One takeaway, one action step. And I want to end with a quote that has long inspired me in doing this work, kind of coming back to where we started. And that's a quote from Martin Luther King, Jr. When he said, we must learn, it's not an option, we must learn to live together as brothers, as family or perish together as fools. I want to thank all of you for all you're doing to help each other learn to live together. And thank you again for this morning.